Yes. Yes, now we can uh, hear you and see. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I will uh, introduce her. In the meantime, she tries to uh, set her uh, presentation. So Professor Ana Flavia Nogueira, she's uh, from Brazil. She obtained her BSc degree in chemistry from the University of Sao Paulo in 1996, after which she joined the group of Professor Marco Aurelio de Paoli at the University of Campinas, Unicamp. Her master's and PhD thesis involved the study and application of polymer electrolytes in dye-sensitized solar cells. Uh, her PhD thesis was the first one in the area of red cell solar cells written in, in Brazil. She got her master's and PhD degrees in 1998 and 2001, respectively. Uh, currently, Professor Nogueira is professor in chemistry in the Chemistry Institute at Unicamp. Uh, she has experience in the field of chemistry with emphasis in, on nanostructure materials and their application in solar energy conversion. Her main research focuses on the development of perovskite solar cells, perovskite quantum materials, and dense energy carriers for the generation of solar fuels uh, through photoelectrocatalytic systems using water, CO2, and other low added value substrates. She has published more than 145 papers, seven book chapters, one book, and holds uh, three patents. Uh, the uh, Nanotechnology and Solar Energy Laboratory, LNES, was founded in 2005 and at the moment has uh, 15 members ranging from postdocs to undergraduate students. And uh, last year in 2020, she won the Leadership in Academia Award given by uh, the CNEN and CAS. So it is our distinct pleasure to, to have Professor Ana Flavia Nogueira today here in uh, Latinx Ken. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Um, please, thank you. Um, thank you, Joaquin. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of Latinx Ken for this amazing opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing here in Campinas. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Can, yes. can you see my Okay, okay, perfect. So um, okay, let's go. So um, today I'll talk about metal allied perovskites, our journey through structure, properties, and stability. So I expect that at the end of my talk, you understand why perovskite solar cells or even perovskite materials are in fact like a very hot topic now in the, in the literature. Uh, so first let me show you where I'm from. Let me close some tabs here. Okay. Uh, so uh, University of Campinas uh, is in Campinas, is in the southeast part of the state of Sao Paulo. So in Campinas, I cannot, okay. In Campinas, we have the University of Campinas. Uh, so uh, recently, uh, our university was uh, select one of the best 10 universities in the world below 50 years old. But of course, unfortunately, we are just kicked out of this ranking uh, because now we are, we are 55 uh, years old. So also in Campinas, uh, 10 minutes from our campus, we have the Brazilian uh, National Labs, uh, the Brazilian Synchrotron Lab. You can see here on the, on the left, this uh, it was the old machine UVX that was turned off in August 2019. So on the, on the right is the new machine series, is uh, one of the two for generation uh, radiation source in the world. So some big lines uh, are open, but, but most of them uh, have been commissioned. Uh, but I really would like to remind you that the Sirius is, um, is an open lab, so uh, they can receive um, proposals from all over the world. So it's, I think it's really important here in Latin America that you have this new machine um, already working here. So also uh, I'd like to present the, the CINI, the Center for Innovation on New Energies that I'm currently the director. So CINI is also located uh, at Unicamp here in Campinas. We have four programs from dense energy carriers, like for instance, the production of a green hydrogen, advanced energy storage, methane to product and computational chemistry. So we are more than 200 uh, researchers engaged in these four uh, programs. Uh, so please visit our website, follow us in the media, 
We have many opportunities for uh, fellowships for PhD and also for postdocs uh, students. Um, and also stay tuned. So we have our annual conference uh, now in the next month, in October from six to eight, very nice talks uh, on new energy. So it's a free online event. So please go to our website and register to our um, conference. Okay, so as Joaquin mentioned, so my background is in uh, is actually in the Dyson style solar cells and organic solar cells. We're no longer looking at these emerging photovoltaics. Maybe we're going back. We don't know. We're just studying this possibility. But most of my students they are now focusing on perovskite solar cells, perovskite quantum dots for light emission applications, and water splitting using photoelectrochemical systems. So today I'll talk about this subject here: perovskite solar cells. Um, I always, uh, I'd like to start my talks with this statement from the former U.S. President Barack Obama. Of course, I, I cannot, I think I don't need to, unfortunately, I cannot um, say any important statement for, from our President Bolsonaro. I think I don't need to give explanation for that. So, But what I, Barack Obama said that the trend towards clean energy is irreversible. Uh, at the moment, we are passing through this transition from an economy that is based on the burning of fossil fuels to economy that has to be more sustainable. So we are now in this transition. And if you look at this scale here, of course, you're gonna see that most of our energy comes from the fossil fuel. So we need to change the scenario here. We need to make the scale like apparently more to the right, to the new energies like wind and photovoltaics. So this is really important, why? because we have um, a challenge here in our society. We are about 70 billion people, but in 2070, we're gonna be 10 billion. So with the increase in the population, outcomes comes with increase in the energy demand that's going to double to 2070 to 1000 exajoules. And also we need to reduce the CO2 emissions. So uh, the moment we release about 32 gigatons of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, I know that many uh, countries have signed many treaties and also the companies have committed to decrease um, until 2070, we have no, we have like net zero emissions of CO2. But I think a point here is also the society uh, needs to, 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 to do, her, uh, to do it, uh, their part, why? Because if you look at here, energy demand, we have not only we need uh, energy for like, transportation, lightning, and but also we need energy to power our like our small appliances, for instance, here. And with the increase in the population, also we're going to see a huge increase. Let me get my point here: a huge increase in the energy for this kind of like computers, laptops, and so on. Uh, I think it's also clear that we're facing climate change. I just uh, took these uh, photos from the internet, but you can feel it here in Brazil. It's really some, yesterday was, we have the uh, 20 degrees, uh, falling the 20 degrees from yesterday to today here in Campinas. So it's crazy. We're facing uh, uh, a serious climate change. Uh, talking about energy, if you look at our primary global energy consumption, you see that 84% comes from fossil fuels, okay? And, and if you look at the world electricity generation here in, here in the left is by fuel category, here on the right is by fuel type. We see here that we need about 60%, 60% of all electricity comes from the burning of fossil fuels. And, and if you look at here to renewable energy, only 2.7% of the electricity that's produced comes from solar. 5% from the wind and about 16% from hydroelectric. So really, really, we really need to increase the amount of renewables energy, especially from solar. Why I'm talking about solar here? According to this source from Shell Sky Scenario, so Shell is expecting by 2020 that 32% of all the electricity that is produced in the world is gonna come from uh, solar followed by 13% of the wind and 11% of, um, of nuclear. We have expected to be an increase and also nuclear. So nuclear, solar, and wind is gonna to correspond to more than 50% of all the um, 
energy production in the world in, in, by 2020. So, but now we are we are just about three percent of the uh, we have only three percent of the electricity that comes from the solar. So, in order to go to 32, imagine this is really a, a huge a huge challenge. So there are many strategies to convert solar energy. For instance, the photosynthesis that convert energy in 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 chemical um, important uh, high energy uh, molecules. Uh, here on the, on the on the middle, we have a photoelectrochemical system. For instance, when you can break the water molecule, you can produce electricity, and this electricity is, is used to produce oxygen and hydrogen. And also a photovoltaic device where we convert the solar energy directly in electricity. So the main focus of my talk is going to be here in a, a new emerging technology uh, for the for, for photovoltaics. So as I mentioned, we need a, ch a challenge in the solar energy revolution. Why? Why you have only 3% of the, of the solar uh, the electricity comes from solar panels? Because all the market is dominated by silicon. So silicon uh, corresponds to 90% of the marketing. The processing is very, um, the, the manufacturing process is very complex, is really energy consuming. So we need to go to new other, uh, new technologies in order to go through this challenge in solar energy revolution. So if here now where the perovskite solar cells stand for, like is a type of emerging photovoltaics, you can see here in this chart from NRL, when you have all of the PV technology, so the efficiency with the, along the years, we see here the emerging photovoltaics are here on the bottom, on the bottom right. You see that the perovskite is this red line with this uh, yellow dots here. So comparing with the silicon, uh, this first generation, thin film that the second generation and emerging, we are really doing very well. It's a really fast growth in efficiency, reaching about 25.5%. Uh, the efficiency of a perovskite solar cells now is higher than the polycrystalline silicon. We're just 1% less than the silicon, than the uh, monocrystalline silicon. Okay. So, and this expect, I think the theoretical um, efficiency, for instance, is higher than 30%. And you, you can see that the first and second generation has already stabilized in terms of, of efficiency. So this is a very, a, a very new technology. And you can see here really fast growth uh, in the efficiency along this like along 15, less than 15 years. So this is uh, uh, the golden triangle for uh, the perovskite solar cells. Although uh, we are doing really well in terms of cost, because you're gonna see here that we can make these devices at ambient conditions uh, using very cheap precursors and very also less uh, expensive methods to prepare to deposit the perovskite films. So we are doing very well in terms of cost. We are also doing very well in terms of efficiency, but there is a still a question mark here. This is a lifetime. You're going to see why. And also, if you have time, uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about the degradation of the perovskite solar cells, because you're going to see that the perovskite is a salt. So, uh, and this is the main, one of the main problems. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll give you a brief introduction about the metal allied perovskite materials, a semiconductor with fantastic properties that are always surprising us in our laboratory. And then I'll focus more in our recent contributions in the field of perovskites when we use in situ experiments coupled with synchrotron radiation in order to understand the crystalline structure, formation of perovskite films, and degradation. Okay, let's introduce the perovskite uh, material. So it's, a, it's a, actually the perovskite describes a crystal structure class. Uh, it's a crystal structure of the titan, uh, calcium titanate. So this is the formula, this is a generic formula for the perovskites, ABX3. So this is a specific perovskite for solar for photovoltaics, okay? So we can see that in the A site, is a, we have a monocation, then can be also organic cation or inorganic cation. For instance, we can have like material ammonium, formamidinium, cesium, rubidium. Uh, B, in the B site, this is a different cation, always you have, uh, in most of the cases you have lead, but also there's many studies involving tin as well. And the allied makes a difference here because the X is allied, can be bromide or iodide. In the perovskite used for water splitting, we have oxide here on the X side, okay? So these are a specific uh, composition for photovoltaics. So MAPI is the perovskite, the first one to be studied. I think most of the papers are focused on MAPI. 
If methylammonium-led iodide, you see here that the A in the A site will have only a organic cation. However, most efficient solar cells are made by combining multiple cations and anions with efficiency than higher 20%. This is an old example from my colleague Saliba, uh, when he showed here that in this paper in science, uh, for instance, uh, efficiency higher than 20% when they mix in the A site organic cations, in the case of formamidinium, cesium, and rubidium. So you have these three cations in the A site, and you have here uh, it's not, not only increase in efficiency, but also in stability. Uh, in terms of the properties of the metal light probe sky, so there are many, many properties. I'm going just to, to cite some of them. Uh, for instance, they have a really high absorption coefficient that is much higher than silicon, like two orders of magnitude higher than silicon. It means that you can, you can make this device, at least the active layer, very, very thin in the order of 300 nanometers. He also can tune the band gap, not only, not only playing with the allied compositions and changing the ratio between bromide and iodide, but also playing with the organic cation as well. Another interesting properties in this material is like most of the defects, of course, the proviscides, they have many defects, but these defects are shallow, I mean, are not harmful. Uh, let me show you some examples here in terms of the band gap uh, in the way that you can tune. You can see here that you can reach like a very um, large range in, in the spectrum, just playing with the composition, just the different ratios between the iodide and the bromide. In terms of uh, absorption here, if, if you compare with, for instance, silicon is the black curve here. Uh, so the perovskite is the, is the red one. You can see here, because the perovskite is a direct band gap, you can see here much higher uh, absorption, even compared to gallium arsenide that also makes part of the first generation. In terms of the defects, that's what I mean by shallow, what is shallow defects? It means that, for instance, for gallium arsenide, cadmium telluride, cadmium telluride is the second generation of photovoltaics, the traps okay, are located in the, in the middle of the band gap. Okay. In the case of the, because of the nature of the composition of these perovskites, you see that these stripes are very close or to the conduction band or to the valence band. It means that it's very quite easy for the electrons or hole trapped in these levels here to be actually, uh, to leave, to leave behind these traps and move through the, through the crystalline structure. That's the reason that the, the defects are actually shallow. Also, you can make this um, metal light perovskites in many different dimensions. So this is the uh, example of an SCM image for the traditional MAPI film uh, that is, is used in, uh, in a photovoltaics, is a 3D. But also we can uh, go to quantum dots, perovskites quantum dots. This is an example of the season uh, led bromide here. Um, that we use for light emitting diodes, for instance, you can have molecular lead free perovskites and also we can have like 2G. For the 2G perovskites, we can make this uh, perovskites like large, like in micron size. Uh, and also we can decrease down to like nanometers, like a kind of nanoplate of this uh, perovskites here. In this case, they're very interesting. Uh, these materials, the 2D, uh, they're very interesting for, for light emitting applications. In terms of device structures uh, and also in applications, most of the structures, different uh, device structures, always you have the perovskite layer and um, that is sandwiched between a whole transport layer and an electron transport uh, layer here. Uh, the work that I'm going to present here today is this traditional perovskite when you have here uh, N-type uh, semiconductor, the perovskites and a whole transport material. And for applications, you can have like as a light emitting diode, laser, X-ray sensors, and a plethora of uh, applications for these perovskite materials. Well, how do a perovskite solar cells work? So this is an example here. Um, when you have here the perovskite, it's a semiconductor. This is the energy level between the, the electron and the whole transport materials. So when you shine light, you create free electrons and holes. So the electrons are transported through this electron transport layer to the FTO, that is our uh, transparent contact. And the holes are actually moving up here to through the spiral. The spiral is the most traditional whole transport material is organic molecule to the gold contact. So this is most traditional structure for a perovskite. 
And then we have here uh, voltage and current. Remember that the voltage versus current, it means power. Uh, in terms of um, uh, what we have now in the market, so this is a big question here. So why, when we're going to see this perovskite solar cells in the market? So this company here, Oxford PV, nah, that has the record for the tandem perovskite. What do I mean tandem? A tandem means that you have a silicon here on the bottom, uh, silicon solar cells, and the perovskite solar cells on the top it means that uh, we can amplify the absorption of light and then we can reach are uh, close to 30% of efficiency. According to this company, in 2020, they're expecting to, to launch the first prototype, the first product in 2022. I uh, hear just a curiosity about perovskite when you compare to silicon. Uh, 35 kilos of perovskite generates the same amount of power as seven tons of silicon. Okay? But uh, in terms of only the perovskite uh, solar module, the record is 16% in an area of 800 uh, square centimeters from Panasonic. Uh, and also, we are also we're doing our model in, uh, in collaboration with Shell in, uh, in Brazil. So expecting our goal is to, to have, uh, this just to make this, well, just make this video works here. You can see here, this, we're expecting to have this module when 20 by 20, this is a demonstration of our uh, module on, uh, on ProSky solar cells. But the first company that surprised all of the community, the first company to actually to have now a product in the market, you can see that is very, very recently, this is just, uh, let me get my laser, it's just June, last June, is the, this uh, Polish company, he saw it, so he claims to be the first company to actually to put this um, perovskite in the market. But the first application that they are envisaging is for a power internet of things devices when actually you need like low power. And also this is also very interesting here is the, this uh, also recently, it was this month, beginning of this month, the space mission uh, is also testing some perovskite solar cells from, from the NRL. Just to update, I, um, just to update the, you about what's going on on, on perovskite uh, recently. So, okay, let's uh, now focus more uh, on the work that we are doing here in, uh, in Campinas. So why synchrotron light, okay? Because synchrotron light is a really powerful tool in order to characterize our materials. Why? It's a high flux radiation, monochromatic, a very high brightness. We can tune the energy, a very high signal to noise ratio. Most of the techniques, of course, are based on X-rays, but I'm going to show here also that you can use, for instance, the infrared from the synchrotron. So basically what you have in a synchrotron, the electrons are actually moving around this, uh, uh, this architecture here around this ring at the speed of light. And when these electrons, they actually are inserted here in this magnet or insertion device, okay? They lose energy. They lose energy in the form of radiation. And here we have a monochromator and you some optics here. And also to have the wavelength that you need your sample, your detector. So most of the examples that um, I'm going to show here today were done in the old machine. Okay, and we're very anxious to, to, to put ours, actually we, we have our ads, uh, put our samples in the new machine in order uh, the perovskite samples. And we are very, very happy with this, uh, just very fresh results that we just got like two weeks ago. Uh, when we have a synchrotron, uh, there is a plethora of experiments that we can do. Okay, especially because in a, in, a, in a synchrotron, you can combine in situ and, uh, and operando experiments with synchrotron light from X-rays to infrared. You cannot do this kind of in situ or operando using X-ray source, for instance, from your university, okay? You have to go to the synchrotron. Um, and we're going to show you today that for the perovskite materials, okay, uh, we, when you couple this, uh, the synchrotron, uh, radiation with these in situ uh, experiments, we can track, for instance, we can track the beginning of the formation of the allied uh, perovskite in solution. Okay, you can make a reaction in a beam line. 
Uh, also, we can follow the formation of the perovskite film and compare the methods to prepare this film. And also we can follow what happens with the perovskite during the thermal annealing. There's a really important step. And also we can probe the initial steps of the degradation. I'm going to show you two types of results because of the time from, from our group for the formation of the perovskites and degradation. But let's take a look at the crystalline structure because this is something that is really important for those that really want to initiate in the field of the perovskite. Uh, how we can define a structural stability? A structural stability is defined as ability of material exists in a phase that is suitable for a photovoltaic or any application. In the case of mapping, that was the most uh, studied perovskites, you can see here uh, at, the room, at the room temperature, you have this MAPI as a tetragonal phase, okay? At higher temperature, it goes to orthorhombic, and at um, lower temperature, orthorhombic, and higher temperature to cubic. So there was always um, people really concerned in the beginning if these transitions, okay, could affect the device performance. Because of course, if you are changing the structure, you are changing the band gap, you are changing mobility, career lifetime, but also was proved uh, recently that no matter, because this small difference in, in this case, small difference if from cubic to trigonal to orthorhombic do not interfere in the device performance. However, the same not, is not true for the FAPI. FAPI is the perovskites instead of methyl ammonium if you form a, form a medinium. Why am I talking about this perovskites? Because this is the perovskites with the most ideal band gap for solar cells. Uh, let's say this is the holy grail of all the compositions. Everybody in the world now is really investigating this perovskite only with uh, formamidinium. Why? But what's the problem with the perovskite, with this uh, type of perovskite? Because at the, at the room temperature, or you know, uh, at, at least in the range of the, pain, the, the temperature that the, the solar cells operate, uh, we don't have a cubic phase because if you remember a perovskite it has to be cubic so this phase this kind of uh, perovskite is hexagonal so the hexagonal is a non perovskite phase we call like a yellow phase okay and this phase is not photoactive so many many efforts nowadays in order to stabilize this um, perovskites here not in the hexagonal form but in the cubic uh, so also i think it's important for you to just explain to you why we are mixing many different cations in the A site, methyl ammonium, formamidinium, cesium, rubid. Why we have to work nowadays with multi cations, perovskites, in order to achieve this 25% efficiency? Why so important? Uh, then we need to go back to the Goldsmith tolerance factor uh, that empirically, empirically uh, we, this, uh, we can predict the phase, the uh, perovskite phase. Uh, with some calculations using here this uh, tolerance factor. This is the size here. If T is equal to the size of the A cation, the anion, okay, divided by also by the square of two, the cation of P and also the, the radio of P and the radio of the X. So when you have this, when you do this calculation, okay, when the tolerance factor is higher than one, that is for this case here, because uh, for Mamidinu is a quite large cation. So T is higher than one. So we have a non perovskite phase. Or when T is, is less than 0.7, it's also a non perovskite phase. That's the case when we have here, we place the for Mamidinu for cesium only. When we have only cesium only, it's also a non hexagonal phase. So in order to have a cubic phase, the phase that's actually proper for a photovoltaic, you have to, you need to have T between um, 0.7 to one. So how we can do that? We can do that just inserting small cations like cesium, rubidium in a FAPI, or even mixing for mamidinium and methyl ammonium. For instance, just to give you an example here. So FAPI and the, in the form of mamidinium of only cesium, there are no hexagonal phases. But if I mix, if I put a little bit, uh, if I take the FAPI, for instance, if I increase, uh, if I put a little bit of cesium, what I can do is like I can push down this tolerant factor file here in order to, to fit here between 0.8 and 1. 
say so that's the reason that you have this multi cation sporoscopy because always we need to in somehow playing with these compositions with these um, cations in the a site we need to reach we need to find the tolerance factor between 0.1 to 1, to 1. Here's just an example how uh, unstable is the FAPI uh, in terms of, uh, you can see here in terms of the degradation, but when you have 15% um, of cesium, you increase the, the, the tolerance to degradation. And not only that, you also increase, for instance, the not only stability, but also deficiency, okay? Uh, also, we are looking uh, at, uh, there is another, uh, um, problem in terms of degradation. I'm not sure if, if I can say degradation, but it's the light induced segregation. Uh, the problem when you have also we need why we're using different compositions between iodide and bromide because this is really important also to adjust the band gap because we really want to go for the most ideal band gap in order to absorb the most of the light. So most of the proskites, although they have many different cations and A sites. They have different uh, ratios between iodide and bromide. But there is a problem when it continues to irradiate the samples, they pass through what we call like allied segregation. It means that we form regions when we are now rich in iodide and other re regions where we are rich in bromide. And this is very easy to follow by, for instance, for PL. You can see here that after uh, shining light on the sample, you see the evaluation of uh, uh, the uh, iodine rich phase here. And this also can be stabilized when you have cesium. That's the case here. When you have cesium, you minimize the, this kind of light induced segregation. And also in this study here, um, we show that depends on the uh, crystalline structure also I have again in terms of stability. For instance, we observe here that most of the cubic proboscides when they have these different ratios between iodide and bromide are unstable, but we can do that by increasing cesium concentration, which then uh, increase the cesium concentration, I can go to a more like the trigonal structures and then we can in terms of stability. So that's the reason that uh, the structure of the, the crystalline structure of the proboscite is really, really important. Uh, we have been working with uh, proboscites uh, containing different ratios between iodide and bromide. You're gonna see here along the end of my talk that we work with two concentrations of the bromide, 17% and 38%. And also we change the concentration from season, sometimes from 10% to 40%. So these are the films that you can get after finishing this uh, the experiment. Okay, let's look at the formation, uh, the formation of the proboscite film here. So how I can prepare a perovskite film? It's very easy. It's just a one-step chemical reaction. For instance, this for MAPI. Uh, we have lead iodide and we have methyl ammonium iodide and the A to B equal to C. And then I have the, uh, the MAPI. So, okay, we start cleaning the substrate. Uh, in the case for the standard configuration, we deposit the, the tin oxides by spin coating, for instance. Then we have a, a short time of thermonealing. And then I take this film here, and what I do have, uh, I have a precursor solution. In this solution, I have all, all of the precursors from perovskites, for instance, in this case here, lead iodide and uh, methyl iodide. So we use the spin coating in order to spread the solution here. Uh, here, another important step. Just a few seconds before uh, turning off the spin coater, I drop what we call like unsolvent. So this unsolvent is going to force the crystallization of the proskite. Then I have annealing, another 10 minutes of annealing for 100 uh, Celsius degree. Then there is the deposition of the whole transport material. And then we deposit the contact by evaporation. Then we have a device. Uh, I, know, I just want to uh, they just want you to pay attention to this antisolvent method. Okay, so these are the precursors. This is the solution precursor that we start. It's really to mention that here we don't have such a, the purity is about ninety percent. So I, we don't need high purity uh, precursors in order to make these uh, devices. I think this is something that is really interesting from the, from the perovskites because we can actually uh, prepare from very cheap low-grade chemicals. 
So this is my postdoc. She's spreading the solution of this um, uh, the solution on the top of the tin oxide uh, layer. I just want you to pay attention that she's going to drop the solvent. As soon as she drops the solvent, there is chlorobenzene. You're going to see a change in the color of the film. Just at, just at this moment that when she's dropping the solvent, you can see now a change in the color of the film. Okay, so now you are forcing the, the formation of the, you know, actually the proboscite is being formed at this stage here. But you can see that we're doing everything inside of the glove box. Of course, you can do it outside. And you're going to see that there are some complications of this method, especially if you really want to go to large scale uh, device. So this is the perovskite film that you can get after the position. So because all of these uh, low grade chemicals, when, because of you are doing manually, uh, what happens like at the end of the spin coating, we end up not only with the perovskite in a cubic form, the one that ideal for solar cells, but also we end up with what we call like the hexagonal phases. Uh, we have two age, four age, six age, three different types of hexagonal phases. They're really hard to control because these hexagonal phases are actually the phase that are thermodynamically more stable than the cubic one. So one question was, and why we don't have, I think I didn't mention that, why I don't want this yellow phase? Because if you look here at the octahedra, we have lead around here, the, the six uh, onions. You see here that in the case for the, uh, for the yellow phase, these octahedra are not linked together, okay? So the transport here is really bad. For the cubic phase, you see that all the octahedra are linked to each other. So this is really what makes the, the transport very fast in these materials, okay? So I don't want this yellow phase, but the point, uh, the question that we made some years ago was like, but can you see where, where there are these, uh, actually these um, yellow phases in the film? Uh, so we went to the synchrotron, now not only to use the X-rays, but also the, the, the infrared. So this is a technique is gonna be available um, by the end of the, it's gonna be available again by the end of this year. It's called like nano-infrared, nano-FTR. Uh, so we couple here um, with AF, AFM with the infrared from the synchrotron, and we collect here the, um, uh, the scattering of the infrared light from the sample. Uh, from this, uh, with the resolution here of 25 nanometers. So in this kind of technique, uh, I think it's really important for, for those that are working in the area of material. So we can have two different analyses. You can have um, a broadband spectrum. Uh, it means like a complete uh, image of the, the infrared response of the film. But also you can choose one of grain. You can see that we did that with the perovskite. And you choose just one grain and you go there and you take what you call like a point spectrum. Okay, I'm not going to details because I don't have time for the to to for details of this work. But this was the same image of the our perovskite, and this is the AFM image that you can get like from the nano infrared, and these are the grains of perovskite. So this is what we call like infrared broadband image. We can see here that the we have uh, this just take just one grain here of the perovskite. You can see here. Uh, that the grains are definitely not homogeneous. When you hear when it's much more like uh, yellow, you see here that there is a depletion in terms of the organic materials in the grains. So now we hope to, we are looking forward to start, continue to study this. Why, what happens in these regions that are very close to the grain boundaries? Means that we have some lack of formamidinium in these regions here. And how can play with the composition in order to minimize this? But what was interesting for us was to also to get the point spectrum. Uh, so we, what happens like uh, we, we, we chose many grains in the perovskite sphere, especially these this greener grains, and you took like some infrared spectrum. So this peak here corresponds 1700, co corresponds to this anti-stretching, anti-symmetric stretching of the formamidinium. And you can see here, and we were able to identify those grains as like yellow face. Of course, they, we, of course, that's in the in this work we use other um, uh, techniques also to prove that. But what was interesting is actually that we could map 
the morphology, we could map the composition using this technique. That, as I mentioned, is going to be available next year here at Sirius. But when you go to the photo, when you go to the perovskite film formation here now, uh, we went back to the synchrotron and used like we call like GWOX. That's the gray's incidence wide angle X-ray scattering. So basically, this is the results that you have. So we have your sample here. Uh, this is the instant beam. So we managed to put, we brought, we brought the, the spin culture from the lab and we put this, we, we put this uh, spin culture in the, in the beam line. You can see here, the, 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 the X-ray comes from this side. This is our spin culture. Okay, that's the area detector. So this is the signal that you can have is the diffraction rings that you can have from, from this film. Okay, uh, the signal is related to Q, but if you remember, Q is also related to, to theta. So this is a, an example, okay, of the data that you can get from the synchrotron. And again, you can only uh, obtain this kind of uh, result if you go to the synchrotron, on where you can actually, because you have a really fast acquisition uh, of this of the uh, X-ray spectrum. So when with this really uh, fast acquisition, you can plot, for instance, the evolution of the diffraction peaks with time. So what we have here in this uh, in this result. So initially, okay, before uh, just when you when I switch on the spin coating, we have this blurry signal here from the signal from the precursors. And as soon as we drop the solvent, you see the formation of a, a very intense peak here at Q equal to 10, okay? This peak corresponds to the cubic perovskite. So here in this case, I just integrated this spectrum here. But also we see here the formation of, other, we have other signals here that also corresponds to what we call like the zagonal phases. And one thing that's interesting when you have this data from the synchrotron is that you can plot intensity with time. And we observe here that we have increasing intensity of the signal from the cubic perovskites and the decrease in intensity of the signal of the zagonal phase. It means that, that before the cubic phase, we are forming the zagonal phases and these hexagonal phases are actually being converted to perovskites along the, the along all the process. Another thing is was that we, we studied in, in, in this case was the time that you dropped in solvent because you observed that it was very it was done manually by my postdoc. Uh, you can see here this is the data that I showed you before. We dropped that solvent 15 seconds 15, 15 seconds after starting the spin coating, and we end up with a very nice morphology. But look what happened. If you take much time to drop the solvent, okay, we the morphology is really really bad, okay. Uh, the point here is like you have to drop the solvent while you still have the signal from the precursor solution. So that definitely this that's the reason that this uh, kind of um, solvent that is the most used method to prepare perovskite, something that you can do in the lab, but not when you can do like if you're really thinking about to go to more scalable to large area. Uh, in terms, if you really want to go to large area devices, another technique that is very interesting for, for the formation of the perovskite is this uh, Dr. Blade technique. Here, basically, let's see if my, it's going to work this time, this video. No. Okay, but I'll start to, I'll do it manually. So you have the solution here. Uh, here on the, on the, um, also on the head of this equipment here, instead of a solvent, you have a nitrogen jet. So the nitrogen jet is going to uh, replace this chlorobenzene. Okay, uh, so you can see here. So we are now spreading. You can see here we are spreading the solution, the precursor solution. At the same time that you are injecting, we are just blowing the sample with this nitrogen jet. You can see here that you can get a very very nice film of the perovskite, very transparent, as you can see here. We use this film to prepare inverted uh, perovskite solar cells where all the layers um, were deposited by this technique, not only transport material, but also the electron transport material. And you got a PC of 14%, it was, it was covered, I think now in May um of this journal uh because all the all this method was done at below uh, at 50 celsius degrees a very low uh a very low temperature 
I think we're approaching. Uh, I think we're approaching uh, the end of my talk. And, and also, when you, what happens when you compare? Uh, what happens when you compare the both method? When you have this unsolvent and you have when you have the nitrogen, we can see here. This is the data that I showed you previously. Okay, this is the data that we showed previously. But in the case when you have the nitrogen, you can see here that the, the crystallization is much much slower. Uh, you can see here that also again we have the formation first of the hexagonal phases, but till the end of uh, end of the experiment, we have both the perovskites and the hexagonal phases. So this is something interesting because if the crystallization is lower, uh, we don't have time to show here, but also the grain size is is, is bigger. And in, in our record now in Brazil, uh, here in Campinas, we have a record of 22%. And this record was done using here this method with the nitrogen, where the crystallization is much slower. Uh, Joaquin, how much time I have? Should I stop here or can I just go to the? I think I'm talking too much today. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I just still have some few minutes. OK. Uh, so what's important here, and when you combine all of these results here, uh, we show that uh, we propose a mechanism. I think it's our contribution to this field. It's like, actually, we propose a mechanism of formation of this uh, perovskite starting from these hexagonal phases to the perovskite. And I think I don't have time to go to degradation uh, and the studies, but uh, quickly, um, just to show that what's the problem with the proboscides, as, as I mentioned, is the degradation, because for the case of MAPI, if you have moisture or heat, you end up with lead iodide that is very toxic, okay? Uh, another point here, you can see, uh, this is the evolution. We did some in situ, uh, some of proboscide films, we did some in situ under like a, a moisture, we increased the, the, the moisture inside of the, our microscope. You see here the, the degradation and the evolution of this kind of micro rods. So uh, we are very interested in to understand what about the, the degradation product here? Because with MAPI, uh, the only product is like lead iodide. But when, when you have these multi-cations, for instance, you can see here by the different colors, you see here that the products are different. So um, let me pass very quickly to this. We also went to the synchrotron, and also you observe there the formation during the degradation, also the formation of these hexagonal phases, and you can see here. And you see when you plot intensity with time, we see the increase in the signal of these hexagonal phases with time. So the, um, it's all about this kind of micro rod. Took us a while to identify but that kind of micro rod that you see forming is not actually, is not lead iodide. I was very surprised to that. You only see lead iodide when you have low concentration of cesium and, uh, and bromide. For all of the samples, besides the hexagonal phases, we have this hydrated perovskite that's actually that micro rod that is, is really forming there. Uh, so the conclusion here, I think from my talk is like the hexagonal phases are there uh, during the formation of the perovskites, because they are then converted to cubic perovskites. And they are also this, the phases that appear uh, just um, with degradation. So I think here we need to learn more about how to control them if you really want to go to more efficient devices. So I um, came to the end of my talk. Uh, when they, I, I, I hope that I have convinced you about this um, this fantastic uh, material, the perovskites. I just want to show here this, uh, the formation is very complex, uh, as I showed before, not only the formation, but the degradation also, the mechanism, I think needs to be more investigated in order to have more stable uh, perovskites. In situ, with or without synchrotron radiation, I think uh, very interesting to, to state some of these problems in the perovskites and Upscaling is really a reality. We're expecting to have these perovskite panels very soon in the, in the market. Yes, there is a lot of things to be done. So uh, I finish here. I would like to thank my group and my collaborators in the Synchrotron, my main sponsors, Papes Shell, and, and other sponsors as well. And thank you for your time to listen to me. And I'm, I'm very happy to take questions also in English, Portuguese, or Spanish. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very exciting talk.
Uh, we still we have some time for a few questions. So if you want to go ahead and raise your hands, uh, Diego Solis from Mexico, please go ahead. Hi, right, thank, thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering if in your degradation studies, have you looked at the temperature, particularly in the formal medium phases? I, I feel like uh, there's little information in that. And, and of course, if you're talking about solar cells, the temperature is probably going to be quite different from room temperature. Okay, um, so we're, we're just planning to do that just before the turn off of the UVX. Uh, we have a proposal now in Berkeley when they're expecting to look at the, the effects of the, the, the temperature on the stability of these perovskite films. We did a work with Giulia Grantini uh, last year, uh, not in, in pure, not in FAPI, but in 3D, 2D, because a lot of work now involving 3D perovskite in a layer of 2D, right? And also using the synchrotron, we show that these 2D layers, when you heat up these 2D, 3D interfaces, these 2D phases, they totally disappear. We are now trying to understand why, what is actually forming now, because we don't see, uh, with the temperature, we don't see uh, the peaks of this 2D structure anymore. But believe it or not, the devices are even more efficient, even after such kind of I mean, degradation, whatever. So the 2D is transforming in a, probably in a mixed phase that is improving the stability. So we are very anxious to start to, because the synchrotron was shut for like more than one year. So we are looking forward to uh, now, I hope that soon next year we can do this, start to do this in situ experiments again. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carlos Mendoza Ochoa, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, Anna. Thanks for your presentation. It was so interesting. Uh, my question is regarding to the piezoelectric effect, which is characteristic for the perovskite structure, right? So have you been studying this in Campinas University, this kind of phenomena? Which, which kind is... of phenomena? No, I, I, did, I missed it. Which kind of phenomena? The piezoelectric effect. Passivation. Piezoelectric, the piezoelectric effect. Ah, piezoelectric, okay. Yeah, piezoelectric, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, have you studied this? Uh, no. I don't know. No. No, because these are more for like, I think for oxide, proskite, like oxide, proskite, right? Um, no, we're not looking at that. I think it's, it's quite a little bit far from uh, our expertise here, but I'm sure that might have some groups here in, in, in also in, in Campinas or Sao Paulo that can actually look at this. I um, can do you find know out. about do you know about some groups of investigation which uh, do do this? Uh, not here, not as far as not, not here in Brazil, but I have some colleagues in Germany that are looking at these properties. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, I, I'm so interested about the change in the structure and how it can convert energy. Now this definitely, definitely, this is really, this is really interesting to, I, I mean, it's still my things to look at. <laughs> As I told you, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really, it's a too open field. This is something that's very exciting because as I told you, the pro skies, they really surprise us, not only, uh, but also surprise us in the lab. Sometimes we're expecting something and then you just uh, come across with a totally different result. That was the case for this 3D, 2D dimension um, we're not expecting the results that we got from the synchrotron. Now we are trying to, we are just burning our head here and try to understand what's going on. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. Gracias, Carlos. Uh, Jesus Velasquez. Hello, so, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Anna. Long time uh, ago. Yes, 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 uh, fantastic work. Uh, Carlos, uh, make sure to go follow CL Wang in Georgia Tech. He's done a lot of stuff with piezoelectrics. Uh, and actually, I, I was asked, I asked a question similar to that to to Frank, Anna, uh, on the on and perhaps using piezoelectricity to do electrochemistry uh, mm -hmm. on these materials. But anyway, my question is a little bit more technical. Uh, uh, well, not that much, but 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 hear me out. So so I, I really like the your the, your gracing incidence uh, uh, characterization using the spin coder. And I, I, 
so are you are, are you doing acquisition when the droplet is on the surface or after you do the, the rotation? No, we're doing, um, we do the, oh, we repeat the experiment in the lab, uh -huh. the same experiment in the beam line. So we, we as I mentioned, we brought the spin coating inside, we built sure. this chamber and we automatically dropped and solve it from outside of the, of the chamber. Sure. So we can control the time that we drop. So we are doing the, the whole experiment the only thing that we cannot do is because I really do like to continue because after the spin coating, you have a 10 minutes of annealing. This is really critical for the proscite, but we, we can, now we're, we're trying to, we hope so. This was uh, for the, when you start to, to use the synchrotron again, we want to, to put the, the spin coating in somehow to heat up the, the substrates because this is going to be fantastic. So you finish the, you collect the, the the formation, and then you just start the annealing and see what happens. So the annealing has to do, you, ha you have to remove the spin coating and put the hot plate inside of the bin line. Or, or you might be able to just construct a, uh, a chuck that is made out of metal that could fit on the spin coater. No. And, the, and then no. maybe, and then through electricity, you could, you could heat, the, heat the chuck of the yes. spin. Anyway, this is really interesting. Uh, uh, thank you so much for an amazing talk. Uh, uh, love your work. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Hope to be in California soon again. Yes, yes. Yeah, as soon as the US let us in. <laughs> exactly. Gracias, <laughs> uh, Jesus. We have a question from YouTube. Nestor Eduardo Katz wants to say, um, very good conference. Uh, thank you. Is it possible to make hybrid cells with perovskites and uh, coordination complexes to increase the efficiency and stability? Well, people are actually putting everything in the perovskites, like from quantum dots to um, polymers and uh, graphene. Uh, my, um, my experience, um, we have a paper on, uh, on graphene, when you use the graphene uh, inside of the, during uh, that precursor solution, uh, we put some graphene oxide, reduce the graphene oxide. And what happens like is going to affect the crystallization. So everything that you put in there is going to affect the crystallization. It's really hard to predict what's going to happen after that. In this case of graphene, uh, we didn't, uh, we, we observe a decrease in efficiency because there's a problem. You, you are putting some something that you are somehow disrupt, disrupting the, the, net, the 3D network. But we have an increase in terms of uh, stability. Uh, it's much more, much more stable when you have the, the perovskite with the graphene. Uh, some people are using polymers, insulating polymers uh, as well in um, mixturing with the perovskite. So you have some loss in terms of especially current, but sometimes you have again, for instance, in, in, in stability. So this, uh, there is uh, some like a threshold between like uh, stability and sometimes efficiency. So we have to be aware that anything that you put in there, uh, you're going to affect the crystallinity, you're going to affect the morphology, and it's really hard to predict, okay, the, the result. But I think it's really worth to use. People are now, there's a very nice work from my colleague from Spain, Ivan Mora Seró, he's, he's putting a quantum dots, okay? And cadmium sulfide quantum dots in the pro skies and really achieve, in order to stabilize the FAPI, that, uh, that's uh, uh, hexagonal phasing, hexagonal phase. And he's really, uh, he's really, uh, he was, he, he, he did that. He actually stabilized the FAPI using this quantum dot. So this is something interesting to look at, how we can stabilize the FAPI using this different, but anyway, we need to test. Thank you. Um, is there any other question here? or on YouTube? If not, I would like to thank you and uh, Jesus Velasquez for your wonderful talk. It was a, a very good session, very exhilarating, and very interesting. Thank you everybody for being here and don't forget we still have some uh, webinars to go tomorrow and the day after that. Thank you everybody, goodbye. <laughs>